Before I begin, I want to welcome Lawrence Finney to worship. Uh, Lawrence Finney is uh, exhibiting uh, a wonderful spirit-filled work of art titled From a Whisper to a Conversation to a Shout. Did I remember it correctly? Uh, I had a good prompter from Garbo Hearn. <laughs> it is a joy to have you in worship with us today, Lawrence, and we encourage as many of you who can and will to visit with Lawrence not only today but also during um, uh, uh, you visit this gallery exhibition and encourage other people to visit as well. I'm hoping to get a chance to visit this afternoon before I have to catch my flight. And it's good to see Celia Anderson. I, I am glad to see Celia, your daughter brought you to church. I'm glad she brought you to church this morning. Amen. Amen. That's an inside joke, right? Okay, we'll keep it inside. Christians believe that the entire creation and all life within it is the result of a loving and righteous creator who produced it in love. We believe that humans are part of the creation. We're neighbors to each other and to the rest of creation because we share the same creator. The creation and all humanity were intended to be part of a divine fellowship that represents and respects and functions according to the loving and righteous purposes of God our Creator. So, when Christians think of the perfect world, we imagine a world where the creation and humanity are in harmony with our Creator. We imagine a world where nature is not threatened or threatening by destructive forces. We imagine a world where humans dwell in peaceful relations with other humans and with nature. We imagine a world where humans and nature are at peace with one another and with God our Creator. But that is not the world we have. We live in a world that is anything but peaceful and anything but harmonious. We live in a world where nature seems under attack from humanity. It is a world where human greed has produced climate change that melts polar ice, raises sea levels that threaten islands in the Pacific, and produces violent and destructive weather, we live in a violent world. We live in a world where famine leads to starvation and storms kill people and animals and destroy vegetation. Yet we live in a world that produces enough food to end starvation and famine if only we cared enough about each other. We live in a selfish and greedy world where some people starve to death while others die because they eat too much. We occupy a world that is vibrant with diversity in nature and humanity. But it seems that humans are constantly at odds with each other because of that diversity. We breathe the same air, we get water and food from the same earth and sky, we bleed the same blood, but somehow we can't see how our destiny is inextricably connected to one another and to the creation we share. We live in a hostile world. And across the ages, humans have tried to ponder out how and why we somehow can't get it right. Why can't we live together in peace and harmony? Why do we, for all our intelligence and ingenuity, somehow always manage to create new ways to be destructive? new ways to be vicious, new ways to be dangerous to one another and to the world that we all share. 
Why do we claim to value peace, but always find ways to make war? And always find more violent ways. Just when we thought we had gotten scared enough with the threat of nuclear war, we had to learn a new word, drones. We used to worry about getting rocked to death. Then we worried about getting speared and arrowed to death. Then we worried about getting shot to death. Then we got worried about getting bombed to death. Then we got worried about getting nuked to death. Now we're worried about getting drawn to death. Why is it that we claim to value generosity but reward the greedy while neglecting the needy? Just this week, the Arkansas legislature turned down a request to spend money to help developmentally disabled people, but set aside money matched with the Walton's money to take money out of public schools and put it into standalone free access private, well, you don't call them private, they call them charter schools, but they're private schools by another name. We worry about not giving money for pre-K. We did not give money for pre-K. We did not give money for pre-K, I'll say it three times. But we have agreed to spend more money on prisons. Why do we speak so highly about nature, even as we're polluting the air and the sea and the earth on which we depend for life? And why is it? that we always manage to do less than we know and take such pride in knowing wrongly or worse still, not caring about the truth. Well, scripture tells us that the answer to these questions lies in the reality and the power of something people don't like to talk about, sin. The familiar lessons we ponder today force us to talk about it because you can't be truly a Christian and not talk about sin. And this is the first Sunday in Lent. And Lent is the 40-day season where Christians, followers of Jesus, reflect upon the reality, the power, the force of sin on us, in us, and around us, and how it afflicts us in being the people God intended us to be. Forty days are spent meditating and reflecting on the reality of human sin and our relationship with God. That's why Lenten season perhaps challenges us like no other season. Because it makes us have to take sin seriously and personally. We are challenged to contemplate the holiness of God and the many ways that sin in us and in the world produces situations that cause pain and suffering, guilt and fear, oppression and death. In pondering the problem of sin, we join people around the world and across the ages from every religious tradition. We reflect on the Hebrew Christian belief that sin entered human experience as a direct challenge to the authority and the righteousness of God. Amen. Although our highest and best living involves trusting God and loving God and living in and with God's creation as neighbors, sin somehow makes us think and act that our highest and best living involves defying God. Sin distorts our moral judgment. It makes us so deluded. It makes us so crazy that we either believe we are God or that God somehow is subordinate to us. We are our own moral authority. We are both the compass and the ship. We're not only the compass and the ship, we're the star by which the compass and the ship are to be aligned. We are accountable to ourselves not to any high authority. And sin in us and in the world causes us to believe we can handle that kind of power responsibly. At its root, sin represents the vulnerability of each person to vanity and pride. 
And the familiar passages chosen for the day bring the point home. In Genesis and in Matthew, we learn that there is an active and intelligent power at work in the world, bent on subverting humanity and the rest of God's creation to itself. That active and intelligent power is described as the serpent in the passage from Genesis. In the passage from Matthew, that active and intelligent power is described as the devil in verses 1, 5, 8, and 11 of the fourth chapter, the tempter at verse 3 of the fourth chapter of Matthew, and given a name, Satan, by Jesus at the 10th verse of the fourth chapter of Matthew. And according to both lessons, the power of sin operates actively and intelligently to entice us away from being who God created us to be, obedient representatives of divine love, truth, and peace. In both lessons, the power of sin challenges whether we should trust God. God really isn't good enough to be trusted. God really is keeping something from us that we need and deserve to have. And we have a right to get it on our own. We have a right to basically override God. In both lessons, the power of sin encourages disobedience to God. In both lessons, the power of sin is like a predator stalking prey, and humans, we are the prey. So in the lesson from Genesis, the power of sin succeeds in tempting people to believe they are capable of handling responsibility and freedom without respecting divine limits. We believe that there should be no limits on our freedom. And so, we believe we can handle the responsibility of not having a limit on our freedom. In one way or another, we are all Adam and Eve. In one way or another, we have met Adam. We have met Eve. They are us. Each of us has managed to believe that we could handle freedom without limits. We could defy God and handle the consequences. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll realize our mistake as Adam and Eve did when their eyes were open. I don't know about you, but I can remember some times when I thought I could handle some stuff, and boom, when my eyes were opened, I realized oops didn't cover all that I'd created. In the lesson about the temptation from Je of Jesus from Matthew, we see the tenacity of the power of sin. This is a power that not only stalks us, it recognizes and attacks us where we are most vulnerable. The tempter shows up when Jesus is hungry. The tempter shows up when Jesus is alone. The tempter shows up after Jesus has begun to start his ministry. The power of Jesus comes at us by our appetites and our desires for comfort. It comes at us in moral and religious life. And it comes at us by our desire for recognition and wealth and power. It always keeps coming and keeps coming like a predator, always on the prowl, always watching, always lurking, always waiting for an opening always knowing that we are vulnerable. The temptation of Jesus shows how we are stalked by a force determined to entice us to distrust God's ability and God's intention to provide for us. We can do for ourselves better than God can provide for us, we think. And so, we all are tempted to try to turn stones into bread. We all are tempted to turn more, less into more. Isn't it amazing that God gives us enough and we always think that God has somehow not given us 
all we need? I'm amazed that people don't believe they have enough sunshine, so we have to go outside and bake. <laughs> I'm amazed at people who don't believe they have enough food, so they have to hoard food and overeat. It is amazing. We are always trying to turn stones into bread. Because we are being tempted constantly by the temptation that God cannot be trusted. That we need to override God. That somehow there is something that God has put us into that we need to go beyond in order to get what we truly deserve. We are stalked by a force also that is determined to get us to go our own way in moral and religious life. And to ex then expect God to rubber stamp our waywardness. All of us have been tempted to jump off something. You understand? Whatever the high thing was. How many of us have seen folks at the swimming pool go, hey, look at me, and try to jump off something, and realize you jumped off into something you couldn't handle? Well, all of us have been in the situation where we have been tempted to go up to a high level and jump off and ask God to pull us out, to salvage us, to sanctify our recklessness. That's what the temptation about Jesus throwing himself on a high perch from the, was about. And we're stalked by a force determined to recruit us to a life of defying and disobeying our creator and our neighbors in creation. The tempter's final invitation was for Jesus to disavow being God's representative, disavow being God's servant, disavow obedience to God, being God's representative of truth and righteousness and peace, and instead become an emperor to self. Let me show you all you can get if you just... Worship me. And how many times have we made the same deal and thought of all the money we could get, all the power we could get, all the prestige we could get, all of the comfort we could get, all the pleasure we could get if we just did our own thing and didn't care about God, about others, about the creation. It was all about me. Well, this, is there any good news? Yeah, there's some good news. Because despite the tenacity and the pervasiveness of the power of sin that stalks us, the good news is that even when we allow ourselves to be seduced and trapped by sin, God doesn't abandon us. God doesn't say to hell with you because you said to hell with me. God doesn't say, if you want to go your own way, I'll let you go your own way and throw up my hands with you. That's good news. Even though we sometimes play the devil's fool, God does not let the devil win by making a fool out of us if we will ask God to redeem us. God will make a way for us. God does not abandon us. God will make a way for us to regain our moral and our ethical footing. God will make a way for us to be redeemed and delivered and restored to divine fellowship and usefulness. The good news is that sin cannot stop God from loving us. And that's good news. Because I don't know about you, there are some times I don't love me. And there are some times I know you don't love me. And there are some times you don't love you. Now, I know we tell each other we love us, but sometimes we don't act like we love us. We don't do loving things with each other. We do unloving things with each other and then tell people we did it because we love them. We have people tell, them, tell us that they took 
money from us. They took help from us. They polluted air and water, and they did it because they wanted to give us good jobs. So we did this because we love you. No, we're killing you because we love you. Ah, uh, no, God doesn't do that. Sin cannot stop God from loving us. We learn from the temptation of Jesus that we're not helpless in the face of sin. Not only are we not abandoned, we are not defeated. Because even though the power of sin stalks us, and even though the power of sin is active and intelligent about our vulnerabilities, and even though the power of sin extends into our systems of religion and commerce and government and all other areas of life, Jesus is our example about how sin can be resisted and overcome. Yes. The devil is powerful, however, the devil is not all powerful. There is a power we can draw on that is stronger than the power of sin. One of those powers is the promises of God. Jesus refused to believe the devil's lie that God couldn't be trusted. Jesus, the devil says, now you can't trust God. God got you out here in this wilderness. You followed God out here, and you followed God out here, and you fasted, and now you're starving. Look where God has you. You may as well use your power and turn some stones into, into bread. Feed yourself, because God's not going to do anything for you. How many of us have felt like God has left us or we're not going to do anything for us? How many of us have ever felt like God has gotten me out here on a limb, and I can't find my way back? And I don't see God nowhere. And in that moment, there is the temptation to turn stones into bread. To believe that God cannot be trusted. Jesus refused to believe the lie that God couldn't be trusted. Jesus refused to believe the lie that trusting God is useless. Man shall not live by bread alone. There is something more than simply being comfortable. Put differently, there is, a, there is a goodness in being divinely uncomfortable. Ah, Martin King was uncomfortable a lot of time. Jesus was uncomfortable at Calvary, but he was good. Standing up. For those who are oppressed is uncomfortable, but it is good. Doing the right thing often is uncomfortable, but it is good. God will lead us into uncomfortable situations, but they are uncomfortable situations that will be for the good of others or for the good of God. And when we are left there, we are led there so that God can make some good use of us. Because God would much rather us be good for something than being comfortable with nothing. Jesus refused to believe the lie that good religion is reckless. And so Jesus didn't throw himself away. You know, there are some people who believe any lie in religion. Amen. And believe me, there are lies in religion. Any religion can come up with lies because lies are, do not have a religion-free zone. They don't have a barrier that says you, you can't go in here. Notice that the devil took Jesus to the top of the temple. Even in high church, there is religion's lie. But Jesus refused to believe the lie in religion. Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, Jesus trusted the promises of God even when Jesus was tempted in religion. Sometimes I think we need to have a, a sort of religious strain on us when we come to church and listen to religious claims. Because we need to have, you know what a strainer is? It, it filters stuff, impurities out of stuff. Because sometimes there are impurities that creep into our religious life. Name it and claim it. The Lord will bless you and make you rich. 
And so we believe somehow that anything we do that gets wealth is a sign of God's benevolence, even if we do it to hurt other people. Ah, oh, and then we praise God for the wealth. Ah, oh, we have to be mindful. When we, when we are led by the Spirit to confront and to denounce and renounce the lies, that defeats the power of sin. And finally, we learn that the power of sin can also be just simply defied. Jesus told Satan, get out of my face. Now, I will give you the Griffin paraphrase. Uh, go to hell, Satan. <laughs> uh, you know, there are, some, there are some times we have the power to say to, 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 to evil, you are evil. You are evil. And it is a right thing to say to evil, you are evil. You have no place in my face. You have no place in my life. You have no place in my politics. You have no place in my social relationships. You have no place in my view of the environment. You have no place in my social relationships. You have no place in my life. Get out of my face. Now, there are some people we have to tell to get out of our face. <laughs> Not only does the power of sin need to be told to get out of our face, there are some people who bring the power of sin in our face. And if we're not careful, we'll, we will allow people who carry the power of sin in them and around them to hang around us and entice us. Jesus shows that even though we're stalked by the power of sin, we have the power to refuse and to rebuff the temptations of sin. We have the power to trust God's promises. We have the power to believe in God's promises. We have the power to reject satanic bribes of wealth and fame and prestige and power and pleasure aimed at turning us into diabolic agents of oppression and greed and pain rather than have us be divine agents of love and truth and peace and hope and justice. The good news is that we are not helpless. Stalked but not helpless. Stalked but not hopeless. Stalked but not abandoned. We are not sitting ducks. We're God's instruments of love and peace and justice and generosity and hope in a world that is stalked by sin. And in Jesus Christ, God has met the power of sin head on. In Jesus Christ, God has stood where we stand. Face to face with the power of sin. And in Jesus Christ, God tells us that God stands with us when sin stalks us. Where is God when we are tempted? God is with us. Where is God when we are confronted by sin? God is with us, saying, remember my promises. Remember my power. Remember my purpose. Remember my love. When sin stalks us, God is standing by. When sin lies to us, God's promises are true. When sin stalks us, God loves us. When sin would pull us down, God would lift us up. We belong to God. And that is the final and best answer to the stalking force of sin in, life, in the world. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that God loves us and that sin cannot steal us from God. Amen.